Father in heaven, we thank you for this day again. Thank you for the way you've been speaking to us, convicting us, weeping us, knocking us, reminding us of forgot forgotten truths, bringing us on our faces and our knees so that we can crawl if necessary till we crawl and get to the cross of Jesus Christ. Lord, how we thank you that in your love you have chastised us. In your love you have rebuked us. In your love you have thundered to our hearts. And we do appreciate all that you have spoken. And all together as a church we say we're sorry for all the things we have done and we're willing to return and come to the center of the will of God and come to the very center of the revelation of the truth. Lord, we know you called us one by one. You called us as a body. You called us as a church that this nation, Nigeria, and this continent, Africa, will know of Christ, of the cross, of Calvary, of the new life, of holiness, of revelation, truth, and light, of heaven, and of relationship with you. Because you've called us with a great calling, we cannot be acting with immaturity and childishness. You are calling us to maturity, you are calling us to stand, and represent you in the world in which we live now. And Father, we thank you for what you are doing. How you are chiseling off and cutting off every redundant thing from our lives. So that we will be the kind of church we ought to be. And we thank you because we can see the result already. We can see the purging already. We can see the cleansing already. We can see the returning into the fold already. We can see the restoration already. But we know that you have not finished yet. Lord, continue the work. And we pray that your hand will still be upon us in Jesus' name. We pray, O Lord, that all your servants that will come up here, you will use every one of us to challenge your church to bring your church back to where we ought to be. And this session now, as we look into your word, Father, how we pray that you will open our eyes, you will touch our hearts, you will convict us where we need conviction. And Lord, we are coming back. As a church, we are coming back. As a whole family, we are coming back coming back to the center of the will of our Heavenly Father. That, Lord, by the end of this Congress, we would be rejoicing in unity of faith that we're now in the center of the will, the plan, and the purpose of God for our lives. How we thank you that in our midst here, there has not been any disagreement with what you are doing. We have not heard of any rebellion against your chastisement. We have not heard of any disobedience against the voice that is speaking to us. Father, we pray that this spirit of unity will continue. And you will wash every one of us clean in the blood of the Lamb in Jesus' name. Thank you for the way that you have given us a heart of reception. That all the people that have been coming here to preach, our ministers from the Lagos Church at the headquarters, our ministers from the states, our ministers from local governments and districts, how they all come here and we receive your word from them. Father, we pray that this same attitude will continue with us. That whichever of your servants and the ministers will come up here to lead us into your perfect will will be obedient and receptive in Jesus name speak to us now 
For we, your children and servants, were hearing you. In Jesus' name, we pray. We come to a session of Bible study now. And this session we're looking at the backsliding of the local church. Yesterday, we looked at the causes of backsliding. And we majored on the backsliding of individuals. But today, we're looking at backsliding as it relates to the local church. Revelation chapter 1, from verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who be a record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that treateth and they that hear the words of, the prof of this prophecy to keep those things which are written therein for the time is at hand. Verse 11 Saying, I am Alpha and Omega the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, and unto Pergamos, and unto Tatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. Verse 19, write the things which thou hast seen, and the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church at Ephesus, write, these things, saith he, that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear with them which are evil. And thou hast tried them, which say they are apostles, and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Jesus is the head of the church. And as the head of the church, he is concerned about the happenings in the church, in the body. He had died and he had given his life for the church. And when you give your life for something or for someone, that thing or that one remains in your heart. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 25, Husbands, love your wives, 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. And so because Christ had given himself for the church, his love for the church will not allow him to forget or forsake the church. And though he had died, and he had been buried, and he rose from the dead, and his precious blood for the redemption of everyone had been split or spilled, he didn't abandon the church to say, I have done everything I ought to do about the church. Now whatever happens to them, I must now sit down on the throne and enjoy my own privilege and the glory that I had with the Father from the beginning, before the beginning of the world. He still continued interceding for the church. Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. We have is able also to save to the uttermost those that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. And as he prayed for the church, he knew the conditions of the church. And at this time, he sent John, the beloved, to write to the church. That's why I've read to you in, a fish, in a Revelation chapter 1 that this was the revelation of Jesus Christ concerning the church. He chose seven of the churches in Asia Minor. They are students of the Bible. You know the significance of seven. Seven depicts or signifies completeness, the whole, the entirety. And the conditions of the whole church he revealed were these seven churches. And as we read about these seven churches, in every one of the churches he said, I know thy works. Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. It says, nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. He was painting a picture of backsliding in that church. Chapter 2, verse 13. I know thy works. And where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name, and hast not denied my faith, even in those days wherein Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you, where Satan dwelleth. But I have a few things against thee. Again, in this local church, Christ said they were in a state that was imperfect. And he had few things against them. As you move on, you find that in verse 24, he also came to this church and spoke to them. And he told them, he also had something against them. Read from verse 19. I know thy works too, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last works, activities and service, to be more than the first but that's not the end of the story. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against you too. 
chapter 3, from verse 1. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, This thing saith he, that has the seven spirits of God, and the seven stars, I know thy words, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. How you think about that? The church of Jesus having a name that it's alive and yet dead. And in this chapter 3, verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that what cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. 19. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door outside the church. And now I'm knocking again. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and will sup with him and he with me. Now you have been thinking of this verse as relating to just an individual, backslider. But if you read the context, it's saying this church of the Laodiceans it's neither cold nor hot. And they were taking pride in material possession. But he said for this church, that the whole church, this Laodicean church, was wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. And Christ now says, he stands outside the door of that church. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, preachers will tell you the door of your heart. That is true, but really primarily is the door of that local church. Then I will enter into that local church. I will have fellowship with the minister, the angel, the leader of that church, and sup with him. And then his eyes will be opened because now he had been blind. He will be given spiritual strength. And once again, the people in darkness in that church will be enlightened. They will be quickened. They will be awakened. Life will come back to that church. Christ is concerned. For the backsliding condition of the church, of the local church. When a church grievously and flagrantly departs from the way of the Lord, that church is in a backsliding position, a deplorable state. And it is painful indeed to trace the sad cause of a backsliding congregation. And it is very tragic. If your own congregation fits the picture of a backsliding church. Backsliding usually begins in a local church with the corrupting of the ministry of the word. When in a local church, the ministry of the word becomes corrupted. Backsliding is starting in that local church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. When the minister, the pastor in the church, begins to corrupt the word of truth, backsliding will be beginning 
in that church when the light of truth and the strength of grace depart from a church the church is backsliding the church shall be holding forth the light of the gospel but when the light of the gospel is not being held forth very clearly and is not shown to the people for all of them to see the light of the gospel then it means that backsliding is beginning already and so what we need to understand or what we need to learn is that if we are going to rescue the church from backsliding we hold forth the light of the gospel philippians chapter 2 philippians chapter 2 verse 15 that ye may be blameless and harmless the sons of god without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom ye shine as lights in the world 16 holding forth holding forth not putting it under a bushel holding forth not hiding it behind the pulpit holding forth not saying i believe the word and god knows in my heart i believe the totality of the word of god hold it forth shine it let the people see declare the entirety the totality of the truth of the gospel holding forth the word of life that i may rejoice in the day of christ that i have not run in vain neither labored in vain when the truth of the gospel and the strength of grace is not being held forth very clearly openly publicly in the congregation backsliding is beginning for samuel chapter 3 verse 1 and a child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. That is, it was scarce. In those days, there was no open vision. You see, when in a church, the word of God is scarce. And you see a lot of other things, a lot of demonstrations, a lot of activities in worship, but the word of the Lord is curse. References of the Bible, curse in the preaching of the gospel, in the preaching in that church, when it is just motivational kind of talk when it is just a kind of demonstrative kind of preaching you see this kind of preachers that their hands do more than their mouth you you find you know some kinds of preachers like that that you know they wave hand and throw up hand and raise up this and throw their leg and kick everything and uh, it's the lip that ought to do much of the service much of the work because preaching is talking not jumping preaching is talking not waving hand preaching is talking not physical combat preaching is declaring the truth of the word of god when you find out that the word of god is curse precious that the people are not hearing the word all they're seeing is demonstration activity moving this and moving that jumping down from the pulpit climbing the pulpit and demonstrating this and dancing a little while they are preaching when well, you see that that is all they're doing in that church backsliding has begun you see over here they were not having the light the full light of the gospel and the word of god was cursed or precious 
in those days and there was no open vision you know the open revelation when you come to the word of god when you come to the church and a preacher comes and he opens the bible and he reads a verse and he interprets it and he applies it and puts it into pieces and he analyzes it and he breaks it down and he breaks it into small small uh, muscles and you swallow the thing and while you are while you are you know reading the word and hearing the word your eyes are widening and opening your heart is being enlightened you are being challenged you are being convicted you are being moved to pray you are seeing that you have gone in the error of your way before you are repenting you are coming back to the Lord that's the open vision you open it up for the people you explain it to the people you analyze it to the people you interpret it to the people you apply the word of God to the people where there is no more clear plain open relevant interpretation of the word of God and the and the application that will match the lives of the people and the analysis and comparing of scripture with scripture where all that is missing backsliding is beginning already and so when the light of truth and the strength of grace is departing from the church the church is backsliding and without repentance there will be no future for that church in my preparation of the outline i read about a church that started long ago and this church in 1952 grew to a number of 1200 and there was life within the church it's called the first church of newton it started long ago but eventually in 1972 they disbanded when they had a membership of 325 they sold the church building and they gave uh, the they gave the church building they sold the church building to another denomination and all their property and asset and assets they gave to a museum and they told the 325 uh, members they said the church cannot continue bye bye they couldn't reactivate the church revive the church restore the church backsliding came and there was nobody with power and fire there was nobody with spirit and zeal there was nobody with revelation and vision there was nobody with concern and consecration that will say i'll give everything it will take and raise up this church again and bring back this church again right into the bosom of the lord and the head of the church and they just gave up and they said we cannot continue and they disbanded that's when christ has been on the outside for a long time and there's nobody to open the door for him by repentance and consecration and restitution and praying and fasting for our church to continue and I'll come back to deeper life. For our own church to continue. With God's presence. And with the purity and the power of the gospel. All of us ministers. And all the members in the church. Must discern. Recognize the signs of backsliding. And wholeheartedly repent fully coming back to the straight and narrow way what are the reasons for church backsliding when a church backslides i've shown you now an example of a church that so backslid and 1972 they had to disband when they had risen to a membership of 1200 in 1952 but 52 to 1982 they were just, uh, you know, declining and decreasing and going down to the point that they couldn't continue again. They just disbanded. What are the things that usually cause a thing like that, that they backslide to the point they cannot continue anymore? Or if they continue, they are completely dead. They don't have the life of Christ and the life 
that is spiritual within them. Let's see one by one the things that occur. Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah chapter 9, reading from verse 16. For the leaders of these people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. That is a problem that brings backsliding for the church, to the church. Now, it says, the leaders of these people. You know, sometimes uh, when you look at different Christians and different uh, Christian people, they do not respond well to a message that extras our lives and ministries. And I see a lot of that in our own church here. By our own church now, I'm talking about the national body of Deep Alive Bible Church in the whole of this nation, Nigeria. When a preacher is preaching and he talks on the promises of God, on the good things, and he's praising us, appreciating us, and he's telling us women are wonderful, and women are gifted, women are talented. And you women, we thank God for you because if we begin to tell all the good things we've done in this church, time will fail us to go into all the details of what you did and what you're still doing now and what you'll do in the future. All the women will stay awake. And they will love that message. But when you come to the other side, and you know there is night and day. You know there is rainy season and dry season. You know it's not, it's not all salt in the soup. There is both salt and pepper. And you know there is the hand of encouragement and the hand of chastisement. And if it's all sunshine without the night. If it's all rainy day without the dry season if it's all salt without pepper there's no balance but you see what some people like is you know just praise just encouragement but you see if we're going to tell the truth there are times we have to discern the signs of backsliding for the local church and as I was saying, when you talk about women and you say, oh, the women are great, the women are wonderful, the women are useful, the women are talented, the women are gifted, and you never say any bad thing, any negative thing, any corrective thing, you have all your congregation. They are all happy. But you can be happy and go to hell. Don't you know the people that dance their way to the brink of hell, and they dance all their lives and go to hell? A person can be happy and go to hell. But you know, uh, when we get to heaven, you can check up. You'll find out the people that get to heaven. And then you look at the people that get to hell. There's something you will discover on the la at that time. There will be more people that have wept in heaven than the people that have wept in hell. You'll discover many people that have been laughing all through their lifetime you'll discover a lot of them in hell fire. That's why Jesus Christ said, Blessed are you people. He looked at them, and he looked at their faces. He said, Look at you weeping now. Blessed are you because you are weeping now. You laugh at that time. Then he looked around, and he saw some people that have never wept, and that were not weeping at that time. They had everything going on for them. He said, If you knew the future, if you knew the future, Woe unto you that laugh now. Because that other time, in the future, you are going to weep without anybody being able to wipe away the tears. You know, the tears of the church is so much. That's why, if I, you know, in Revelation it says, He will wipe away the tears from their eyes. You know, if He has to do it in eternity, it means that all through life, 
you know, there is time to weep. And if, uh, you know, the kind of message you want, a kind of message you say, all those women are wonderful, make you laugh, make you happy, make you jump up, there's no future for you. But you know, when you come like this, and we tell you the word of God, and we knock you, and we cut you, and we crush you, and we chastise you, and we tell you the plain teaching of the word of God, that makes you to understand that you have been going astray. And you go before the Lord as if you are the greatest criminal on earth. I will praise God for you. You know when somebody comes like that. And you know it's just he rushes and runs to the cross. And he's not even able to look up at, the, at Christ. He just falls at the feet of Jesus Christ. There is hope for that person. But the fellow that is always, you know, anything you preach is always laughing, always happy. That one doesn't concern me. I'm the good fellow. I'm the righteous fellow. I never make any mistake. There's no future for them. If you know such people, pray and fast for them. And don't stop your praying and fasting for them until they begin to cry and weep. It's only then you know that your prayers has been answered. Now, I said all that to tell you this. In this verse 16, for the leaders of this people cause them to err. When we talk about leaders, we're not only talking about the pastor in the local church, we're talking about the wives of those pastors. I said all the things I said before to come to the interpretation. The leaders of these people, and you women, you are leaders in the church and you have contributed in a major magnitude to the backsliding of the local church if people tell you you have contributed to the progress i don't know about that if they tell you, you have contributed to the revival i don't know about that if they tell you, you have contributed to you know the church being militant I don't know much about that but i know this that you have contributed in a very major way magnitude to the backsliding of the local church if people tell you you have contributed to the progress i don't know about that if they tell you, you have contributed to the revival i don't know about that if they tell you, you have contributed to you know the church being militant i don't know much about that but i know this that you have contributed in a very major way, magnitude, to the backsliding of the local church. Your influence on your husband. Your influence on the other women. Your lifestyle in the church. Your utterances in the church. Your way of life in the church. For the leaders of the people, they cause them to err. And they that are led of them are destroyed. You see, this is one of the reasons for backsliding of the local church. And the word of God clearly shows many reasons why the church, a local church, may backslide. Let's pick them up one by one. Number one, the absence of leadership. Number one, the absence of leadership. In Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter 32, from verse 1. And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of of the mount the people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him up make us gods which shall go before us for as for this Moses the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt we what not we know not what is become of him and Aaron said unto them, Break up the golden earrings 
which are in the ears of your wives and of your sons and of your daughters and bring them unto me and all the people break off the golden earrings which were in their ears and brought them unto Aaron and he received them at their hand and fashioned each with a graving tool after he had made each a molten cow and he said these be thy gods O Israel which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt I have a question for you could they do this if Moses had been there with them tell me out loud no the absence of leadership and in some case his absence was legitimate in his own case his absence was God's will in his own case his absence was the making of Almighty God God called him in his own case his absence was for the development of the nation of Israel to get the law from God and bring it to the children of Israel in his own case his calling to go to the mountain was even praying and fasting was denial and he got the law of God that will be preserved for future generations in his own case his absence was not because of self-indulgence was not because of pleasure and yet the absence still resulted in the backsliding of three million people all the nation you see when the pastor is not always around and he says i put somebody in charge moses put aaron in charge and the aaron that he put in charge was not voted into office it was almighty god that gave the name of aaron to moses and said he will be your mouthpiece look moses and aaron were chosen by god and aaron was an assistant to moses and even though aaron was chosen by god when moses was absent he didn't have some qualities that moses had because when moses came back and said aaron what have you done he said you know the people and my consecration is not consecration unto death my consecration is not is a consecration unto life I have not got to the place where I can consecrate and say for better, for worse, for life, for death, in sorrow, in sickness. I will minister the truth. I will stay by the truth. My consecration is only for prosperity and for blessing and for life and for enjoyment. It is not for death. I've not got to the place where I can say nothing shall separate me from the love of God, neither life nor death. And when I saw, you know the people, when I saw they wanted to stone me, and since I'd not made consecration for death, I said, no, uh, don't worry, I'll give you what you want. But I know if it were you, you don't care for death. That's a pastor. A pastor who doesn't care for death, who doesn't care for, you know, whether you abuse him, whether you go against him, whether you frown at him, whether you talk against him on your dining table in your house, a pastor who doesn't care for gossip, that's the one that can keep the church. But Aaron was not a person that didn't care for anything. Aaron cared for everything the people were to do against him. And he said, that is why I did that. You know, when a pastor is not staying in the location where we are put him to be a pastor, and it's all the time, you know, he's going to America and going to Europe and going to this and going everywhere. Look at all the churches around, all the denominations. Why are they backsliding? While they are away, a lot of things are happening. You know, let's say, for example, the pastor, I mean, a pastor like Moses. A pastor that has fire. A pastor that has a spirit. A pastor that has revelation. A pastor that knows if, a, if anybody comes to that congregation, a pastor that if a witch or a wizard get to that congregation, the moment he comes to stand like this, and the moment he begins to open the Bible, God will open his eyes and he will say, that witch there, you come over here, and you know Moses, Moses will not waste and say, everybody, 
go and look for stone. And now when a pastor like that is around, which is clear away. Am I right? A pastor that when he sees a little sin there, little immorality there, I will stand up and say, you, you did this, make announcement to everybody. And now when a pastor like that is around, people sit up. But when a psychedelic fellow, easygoing fellow, a merry fellow, and a, a person that is that addicted to enjoyment, easy life, like Aaron, when he's there, all the witches now can come in. Moses is not around. Moses is not here. All the compromisers can come in now. All the people that don't pray to know the will of God before they get married, they can do whatever they like now. And all the people that, you know, will tell lies and will give uh, testimonies that are not true, they can come in now. If uh, Moses is there, you dare not do that. You might lose your life. But when the pastor is absent, pastor, stay in the church. If we are going to keep the church from backsliding, stay in the church and stay at the pulpit. Even when you are not preaching, stay there. You know, that's what I do in Lagos here. Even when I'm not preaching, I stay all the five services on Sunday. Even when all I'm to do is just to announce the song, I stay there. And while I'm staying there, you better believe I'm looking at everything that is going on. And if somebody preaches something, if he misses sound doctrine by half an inch, immediately he finishes that message, I call him. I say, you miss sound doctrine by half an inch. Now, when, when a pastor like that is all the time sitting down there, all the time watching you, it will be difficult for you to backslide. You know, that, that one alone can keep deeper life and save deeper life. If all you that are pastors, all you that are coordinators, all you that are zonal leaders, all you that are women representatives, if you always stay, we want you to look at the house fellowship. All you that are house fellowship leaders, all you that are area leaders, you are always there. Always there. Always there. That will keep this church from backsliding. Because God has given you the word. He has given you the fire. He has given you the authority. He has given you what the church needs. But if you are absent, then Aaron will come in. Look, look at your life work. Look at uh, Moses. Moses had been laboring for these people. And he just went away. You know how many days? 40 days. Six weeks. And before he came back, everything he labored on, six weeks, everything had been totally destroyed. I'm hearing of some people that say, I know I'm a pastor, I know I'm a leader, but uh, give me permission. Let me go to America to study for three years and then I will come back. What will, have hap what will happen to your congregation? 1974 and 75, I received invitation from America from a particular Bible school. A friend of mine, in, you know, that I knew in another place before, and who loved me and, you know, wanted me, he wanted good thing for me. He had uh, spoken to the registrar of that Bible college, and they wrote to me, and uh, they said, now you can come. And he said, now I shall come, this is my time, I shall come for three years, and I shall come and get, you know, a degree in a theology, because if we're going to do this work of, you know, of church work, we need degree, we need masters, we need diploma, we need this and that, that I should leave. And deeper life was already on at that time. I looked at the invitation, I looked at the privilege, I looked at the opportunities. Uh, you, if you know me, it's difficult for me to spend a week outside the congregation. I'll be feeling like fish out of water. I won't enjoy anything I eat over there. It's difficult for me to be away. Even when I go to preach in other places, you know, there's no place like home. You know, you come back and you like to be at the pulpit. Even if it is to sing Jesus only, Jesus ever. Jesus all in all will sing. Savior, Sanctifier, baptizer healer and the coming king we don't hear that song any other place 
Have you been hearing it other places? Except those who hear it from here, and then they take the fire from here. And you know, when you go out here, you go out there, you don't hear any song like, Deeper, Deeper. I pray, I want to go deeper. You don't hear any song like, Called Unto Holiness. You don't hear any song like going up higher. All the song they are singing is just with guitar and, you know, mixing and dancing. When, you, when you're in a place like that for one day, you want to come back home. And when you come back home and you hear the people, the crowd of children of God, they rise up and they say, Jesus only is our message. Jesus all in all will sing. Then you know you are back at home again. But anywhere you go, you don't hear all that song. The real word of God, you'll be like fish out of water. And I rejected all that offer. All the things that they were giving, I rejected. Do you know that Bible school are still calling me this year? I've received a prospectus. I never applied. They said I should, uh, you know, come for, you know, post-graduating, you know, this and that, that they have heard about the work I'm doing, now I need this, now I need this. And, you know, the names of uh, some schools, very high schools, Fuller Theological Seminary, Saint, uh, you know, broke here to me, letter to me, and a scholarship uh, form and, you know, all the project and everything, what I could just this year. And without, I didn't apply for that. They are calling me to come and do this and do research. And then they put at the, in the letter, they said, we will also give you a point to share with the student body what is going on in Africa. You think I will reply such a letter? Now you see, when the pastor is absent, when you do not stay in your congregation where you are, you see the church come backslide. So number one is the absence of leadership. Listen. Why churches, local churches backslide is leaders' bad example. Let's look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6. My people have been lost sheep, their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. And it's a bad example of the leaders that caused that. You see, there's much on leadership. If the church is going to remain, if the church is going to stay in the real center of the will of God, the leadership will have to live good example good example in first timothy chapter 4 verse 12 first timothy chapter 12 chapter 4 verse 12 let no man despise thy youth but be thou an example of the believers an example in word an example in conversation an example in charity, an example in spirit, in fervency and zeal, an example in faith, an example in purity. That's how to keep the church from backsliding. When you as a pastor, you as the pastor's wife, you as the zonal leader or coordinator, you as the area leader or woman representative, when you have a good, challenging, convicting, convincing example, then the church will remain. But if, on the other hand, you have an immoral kind of life, a sentimental, compromising, unfaithful kind of life, a substandard, unsanctified kind of life, you know, the influence on the church will be that the church will backslide. In um, Isaiah chapter 56, from verse 10, is watch men are blind. They are all ignorant. They are all dumb dogs. They cannot bark, sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yea, 
They are greedy dogs which can never have enough. And they are shepherds that cannot understand. They all look to their own way, everyone for his own gain from his quarter. Come, say they, I will fetch wine. Remember, these are watchmen. Remember, these are leaders. Remember, these were the people that were supposed to show the people the way of the Lord. He said, they say, come, I will fetch wine. And we will fill ourselves with some strong drink. And tomorrow shall be as this day and much more abundant. You see, when it is like that, and the leaders have bad example, bad example, then the church will not be able to follow the truth and the light. Our lives matter a lot to so the congregation. The third reason, immorality and love of money within the leadership. That causes backsliding, immorality, and love of money within the leadership. In 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 2, from verse 12. Now, the sons of Eli were sons of Belial. They knew not the Lord. And they were priests. They were leaders. And they were people that were supposed to show the light and the truth to the congregations of Israel. God had placed his name in Shiloh and these people were there but they were sons of Belial they knew not the Lord verse 13 and the priest custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice and a priest servant came while the flesh was in seething with a flesh hook of three teeth in his hand, he struck it into the pan, or kettle, or cauldron, or pot. All that the flesh cook brought up, the priest took for himself. So they did in Shiloh. Unto all the Israelites that came thither. Also, before they burnt the fat, the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed, Give flesh to roast for the priest, for he will not have sodden flesh of thee, but raw. And if any man said unto him, Let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him nay. But thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for the people abhorred, they hated, they resented the offering of the Lord. When things like this happen, such people in leadership, they cause the church to backslide. Now, if we say this, and we do not bring it home to ourselves, we do not understand that we are guilty, and that we are causing backsliding in the church. When we come to a workers retreat or we come to leaders congress or we come to a meeting that brings us together with other people and you see this attitude and some of the people pastors leaders they'll come early and take all the good mattresses they put all their loads there 
We make announcement, come and register. No. They have secured their place. And they're not going to budge. Then maybe we have a nursing mother. And we need mattress for the nursing mother. And the three-month-old baby cannot, uh, you know, be put on the bare ground on an ordinary match. We need mattress for maybe that mother and a child. And we say, ah, sister, you are a single sister. You don't know, uh, you know, you are still strong. Look at this nursing mother. I'm a woman representative. What do you mean? That nursing mother, who is she? Come, nursing mother, who are you? What do you do in your state? I am house fellowship leader. Tell the people who told you to come and take my dress from me that I'm a woman rare. Therefore, if, if your child is going to have cold, good luck to you. The people, the higher we go, the more respected she will be. Therefore, you go and find what you are going to use. Or if you are distributing food, and uh, were it not for what we have written on the program here, that there is no special food for anybody, no special time of serving for anybody, the state overseer's wife may get to the kitchen and uh, say, who is in charge of the cooking here? And, uh, and they say, Sister Eni, what's the matter? Shut up. I don't talk to people like you. What's your name? Who are you? By the way, from which state are you? You've not seen me in the, on this ground before. When were you born again? Who are you? And the person begins, uh, uh, please, ma, I am sorry, ma. I don't, no, 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 what's your name? From which state are you? Don't you know I'm state overseer's wife? My husband is hungry and is waiting for me to bring food and to get to him. And you, I'm sorry, ma. I'm sorry, ma. Sorry for what? You people, a person like you should not be invited to this meeting like this. You don't look at people's face before you reply them. And the person begins to kneel down to state overseer's wife. The quarrel is not finished in one hour. And then she gets in there, takes milk, takes bomb vita. Sister, we bought this for the nursing mothers. Nursing mothers, mo nursing mothers are greater than my husband's state overseer. Ah, ah, sister, I didn't know that it's for state overseer. What's different from what this of now Phineas did? Food, meat, milk, gary, rice. That we cannot show. The retreat or the congress is only Monday to Saturday, six days. Can't you watch with me just one hour? Celestial people will fast for seven days. CAC will fast, dry fast, seven days. Here you are. You can't, can't you fast one day? That state overseer's wife will fight on Gary on rise no wonder the church is like this and if we say now everybody go to the hostel now all of us who are going to sleep at the hostel state overseer's wife can hear that or never budge will stay in a place fun i don't know whether they even have air conditioner there now they get a lot of things that I don't know anything about that I never get permission for. That's why I've been very strong in some things I'm saying this uh, Congress. And uh, you know the state of Asia's wives are there and we say now come out, come out we want them to do this and you come and lead and you help us in the kitchen help us there, help us there uh, state of Asia's wives will not be there. And when we eventually see them you know, they are cooking special food and, you know, the, you hear the smell of food. Ah, is there a restaurant around here? What's the matter here? Then you discover that a special something going on deeper life. And yet, these are the people that are saying, they stand on sound doctrine, they are the pillars in the church. You are a caterpillar in the church. You are the people that are breaking down the pillars that we built up many years ago. Because of food, because of convenience, because of housing, 
because of mattress, because of bed sheet, because of pillow, because of little, little things. Tell me, my sister, when Moses went to the mount, 40 days, did he take mattress there? Did he take camp bed there? Uh -uh. When our Jesus, when he went to the mountain top to pray, did he take camp bed there? Mattress there? The Mount of Transfiguration that we read about in the Bible. Do you see mattress there? What's the matter with us? Why can't we watch with Christ and come back to the old path? You see, when we begin to use force, pride, we bully on people and we take whatever we like because I am so and so, I am such and such, you are the one making the church to backslide. Because other people will see what you are doing. And they will say, if so and so can get away with it, how about me? If so and so can get away with it, how about me? You see these people, let's correct our ways. I believe we'll correct our ways. Look at First Samuel again. Chapter 2. From verse 22. Now, Eli was very old. And heard all that his, son di his sons did unto all Israel. And how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. You, you see the, the whole outcome. The sons of Eli, the priest. You know the first assignment of the priest? The first assignment of the priest is to teach the Ten Commandments. After that, all the statutes and all the laws. After that, all the ordinances of, you know, sacrifice and this and that. But the number one thing, the Ten Commandments that the priests were supposed to teach. These were the people that were supposed to teach the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not commit adultery. They were committing adultery with the people. Now, it wasn't only private now. At the door of the tabernacle. Can you imagine that? What are we going to say about women that are in the choir? Not because they can sing well, but because they are the pastor's favorites. Pastor's second wife. They don't wed openly. They have not gone to the stage of Ophna and Phinehas. They don't have marriage certificate. They tell us they have one wife. That's what they tell the public. There's somebody you know that is called their wife. That's what they tell the public. But they have another wife. Second wife. Polygamy. God knows your house number. He knows your life. You are deceiving us. Ah, the trumpet will soon sound. Just a matter of months or years, and everything will be plain. I tell you, there are some women who are called area leaders. They are not qualified to be there. The people who are qualified because they cannot kneel down and, you know, give their body as, uh, you know, a gift so as to become area leader. They say, you are stubborn. You know Bible, you know righteousness more than pastor. If I call you and I just say, how are you? You'll be, you know, folding your hand and drawing back as if I'm not your pastor. You know doctrine more than your pastor. Eh, you, you know doctrine. Stay there. You will never be useful in this church. You all this other. Uh -uh. Are you the only sister in the church? All this, uh, this sister is free. This sister, you know, but you frown your face and as if uh, holiness is frowning face and frowning face. And you, all the other good, good sisters, you know, they will smile and they are nice. And you never came to my house and even say, Pastor, I want to come and sweep your house. I want to come and cook for you. I want to come and wash your clothes for you. And sister, sister, and you say you are a Christian. Eh, hey, stay there. You see, so and so now is a woman, right? So and so now is an area leader. And if it's a leading house you want to be doing all through your life, and be frowning your face and folding your hand, you will lead house fellowship. 
the info the instruction is that if you slow down and you you know you are good and you you know give your body and you are not that strict and hey you will have whatever you like that's what they are telling them god knows you and that is why the church is backsliding a man that is committing immorality in secret what will you come and preach in the public a dog how can you as a dog come to the pulpit and then preach as a saint of god you will not have the confidence you will not have the boldness and all your, you will never preach against adultery and against fornication. All that you will be preaching will be all the other subjects. There are many subjects you can find in the concordance. That's what you will be preaching. But the real thing that will knock the nail at the right point, you will never preach that one. How can you preach against adultery when your girlfriends are in the congregation? And you know, they are looking at you. Which mouth will you open? If you open your mouth and say, and the Bible says, if you look on a woman to lust after her, the, your girlfriend will close his Bible, her Bible and open her mouth and say, what? So and so. So you know that part of the Bible, and you did that thing with me two days ago. You can't preach that. And that is why the church backslides. When the pastor, the leader, is immoral well, we're talking about men what are we going to say about women pastor's wife that has boyfriend in the congregation what are we going to say pastor's wife that will not stay at home where did you go goes to see brother so and so brother so and so brother so and so god knows your number you think you can deceive us as you see us, oh, we know things. We see you. That we don't, uh, you know, mention your name publicly and say so and so and point to you there. God has different methods. He knows your sin will find you out. And so these people, this is the reason the church backslid. And they could not stand on sound doctrine, the sound teaching of the word of God. Another reason for the backsliding of the church is false prophecy and deceit in pastors. False prophecy and deceit in the pastors, in the leaders, in Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Reading from verse 8. The priest said not, Where is the Lord? And they that handle the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me. And the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after the things that do not profit. Prophecy comes in different ways and uh, you better make sure that you are really following the lord it is not everyone that says thus says the lord thus says the lord that has the genuine spirit of god make sure you are really following the lord and do not just uh, it's not compulsory to say thus says the lord there is enough thus says the lord from genesis to revelation Except ye repent, thou shalt likewise perish. That does this, says the Lord. Repent and believe ye the gospel. That is, thus says the Lord. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is, thus says the Lord. And that Jesus Christ, that he might sanctify the people, he suffered without the gate. Let us go out therefore beyond the gate, bearing his reproach. That is, thus says the Lord. And that you gather in Jerusalem and wait until the power of God, the Spirit of God, will come upon you. Because as John baptized with water, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days since. For ye shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost part of the earth. That is not, says the Lord, without holiness no man shall see the Lord. That is not, says the Lord. You have all the dust, says the Lord, in the Bible, and you are looking for another dust, says the Lord, and you are becoming occultic. Becoming occultic. Because uh, you call the name of Jesus five times or seven times before you say what you want to say. What is that one? You lie on the ground, you roll on the ground before you pray. What is that one? You put on a, a kind of a particular spiritual Negro uh, music uh, before you can pray. The music will be there, you will be praying. What is that one? And all that you listen to is only promises of God. What is that? Is the totality of the Bible. But you know, as you bring in this and bring in this, and you say, well, I now, I can see this, I can see that. Balaam also saw. He saw prophecies. He saw vision. He had trance. Where is Balaam now? He's in hellfire. It is not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, that shall inherit the kingdom of God. Except those, only those that are doing the will of my Father who is in heaven. For many shall come unto me in that day. And he will say, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we not cast out devils in your name? And in your name I've done many wonderful works. And after all that, I tell my sin and categorizing of all the miracles and signs and wonders, Jesus will say, Depart from me. I never knew you. Ye that work iniquity. Where did you get your revelation when you are not sanctified? You are beating your wife. And you are prophesying. Where did you get your prophecy? You are getting angry and because your wife was a little bit late in cooking. And you got so angry that you say you are not going to eat. And while you even want to drink, drink the water, your wife is, ah, my husband, I'm sorry I was late. You threw the water on her. And then you go to church and say, there's somebody there that has headache. Where did you get your word of knowledge? How can a man, no purity, no holiness, no sanctification, then come to the pulpit? Don't do this rubbish in our pulpit. This is not your own, this is deeper life pulpit. Our pulpit should be pure. But all these people that do all these things, then they come in front of the congregation and say, there is somebody there, shut up. Which person is there? Who told you there is somebody there? And then the Lord will tell you on the last day, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that walk in iniquity. Get pure. That's what our teacher was teaching us this morning in the gospel landmarks. Purity before power. That we will be holy unto the Lord, before the Lord, all the days of our lives. When Christ comes to approach, take away the Adamic nature from you. And inside and outside, you are pure. Transparently pure. Continually pure. Wholeheartedly pure. And you are pure within and without. Your language is pure. Your imagination is pure. Your thoughts are pure. Your lifestyle is pure. Everything that you, your dreams are even pure. Because the devil cannot be coming to you and messing you up. And then you waking up, you know, here and there. You are pure in the dream and pure in the day and pure on the road and pure in the bus. And pure when you are sitting out with a lady. And there is no strange fire that is burning in your flesh. When you are sitting with a lady, you are pure through and through. It's after that purity you can come to the shekinah place where the holy of holies where you have the shekinah glory of god and you can say lord look at me i've been at the brazen altar outside i'm born again i'm saved and whosoever is born of god does not commit sin because the seed of god remains in him he cannot sin 
he cannot sin because the seed of God is there because he's born of God in this the children of God are known and the children of the devil whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God but now we are, we are of God little children and we have overcome them because greater is he that lives in us than he that lives in the world it is when you have gone through the brazen altar you have come to the holy place and the power of god and the angel has taken the the live coal out of the altar and it touches and it says your sins are cleansed and purged and cleared away it is then he will say who shall i send who will go for us then you will come to the altar you say here am i and the fire of the holy ghost will pour upon you but the kind of holy ghost you have that is still having secret sin that one is not holy ghost that one is your own imagination that one is your own human spirit but the fire from above the holy ghost from above that will come upon you and just fill you and overflow in your life and then you will know that you are a real minister of the gospel if we're going to keep the church from backsliding there must be purity and holiness and a righteous lifestyle then there will be the power of god that's what we call christianity all this other kind of stuff that you are dealing with that one is that's not the way that one is not the way you come back if you get if you need to get saved again get saved and get sanctified and let the power come afresh upon you and so then we will know where the prophecy is coming from we will know where the revelation is coming from we will know where the word of knowledge and the word of wisdom is coming from. We will know where the manifestation of the gift of faith is coming from. We will know where the walking of miracles and the healing of sick. We will know where it is coming from. The discerning of spirit and the casting out of devils. We will know where it's coming from when we can see that you are pure through and through. Pure because only the pure in heart shall see the Lord. But you know, a man is not pure and is giving us prophecy, dream, revelation. Throw it off the window. That's what they are doing in those other places, white garment places. Why are you bringing those occulty things into our midst? We don't need that. I don't need healing from the devil. I, I never allow, I've never allowed anybody to lay hands on me if I know their lives are not clean. And I've had many people, when I was a younger Christian, even a one-year-old Christian, two-year-old, three-years-old Christian, you know, I've been like this since I was born again. I've, I've not been, I'm not a compromising kind of person. And, uh, you know, I've had people, and I can give you their names, you know, all over in this country. A particular fellow came to Unilag one day, and he was uh, ministering. You know, I just stood there, I was looking at him, and I pitied him, because I knew a lot about him. And then at the end of the whole thing, he said he wanted to lay hands some people. They are going to receive something. And because I was a lecturer at the university, you know, he called me. He's a bold kind of person. Uh, who He wanted to demonstrate. He said, uh, brother so and so. He mentioned my name and said, let me lay hands on you and demonstrate. To I said, me? I said, no, never. And he started saying, in Jesus' name, I said, not me. He pleaded, he pleaded. All the congregation at the Unilag, uh, at the Unilag Hall there, all the congreg they were looking at for about five minutes. He was still talking to me that, you know, because of the ministry and because, uh, you know, he wanted to show an example for us. I said, no, not me. If you want to lay hands on others, go on. But me, my own head is, you know, not like that. It's not every dick and harry that can lay hands on me. You know, if you don't take your stand, if, you are, if every person can, you know, this one will come and lay hands on you, this one lay hands on you, no wonder after you say you are saved, you are having bad dreams. You say you are having this one. Because of all, do you know where they have put their hand? A fellow that will be, you know, doing rubbish with a woman before coming to the congregation to lay hands of, on me. If I had allowed them to lay hands on me, I will not be like this today. Thank God their hands never came on me. But you people that everybody is laying hands on you everywhere. If their hands are defiled and rotting, don't let them put their hands on you. And so, if the church is going to keep the real standard and the church will not backslide, then we must correct all these things. Number five, uninspired women and immature children in leadership. You see, there are times when uh, you have uh, children 
that are leading people, people that are immature, people that do not have the word, they do not have the life, they do not have the sincerity. They are just completely immature. Look at Isaiah chapter 3. Isaiah chapter 3, verse 12. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Then let us look at 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings chapter 21. Verse 25. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. You see, women, if you are not, um, whenever you are talking to your husband, you take the place of the Holy Ghost. In the early years of this ministry, if I gave a message to a man, generally, their wives don't even know until they come to the, pul to the pulpit to preach. In the early years of deeper life. But now, under all sorts of excuses, they will be saying, so I can pray with you, so I can do this, so I can do this. Has the pastor called you? Has he given you a message? What message did he give you? Are you the Holy Ghost that is to give him inspiration? Are you the one that is to teach him what he's going to say? And while he's preparing that message, ah, my darling, my brother, I, if you give this illustration, if you give this example, and all the people that have offended her in the local church will pump everything to the heart of her husband. And then when the man comes to preach, the people I knew before that can preach heaven down. I see their messages now. They have pumped them with another information. They cannot preach the word again. You women have done havoc. You have influenced your husbands in the wrong direction. In the wrong way. Leave them alone. Stay in your place. Do the little we tell you to do. And if there's any extra that I want you to do, we'll tell you. But don't get to the places where we have not put you. You are not the Holy Ghost. You know, sometimes it's the wife that determines who is disciplined in the church and who is not disciplined in the church. And in some churches, deeper life, if the pastor there discipline somebody if that fellow can go and lobby for the wife and then the wife will say don't worry one week you'll come back and the fellow will go back to the husband and say ah uh, darling uh, you know all these people we ought to be patient for people and actually uh, you know i had that sister's son so what did she do ah she's a good fellow Maybe it's just a little mistake. When they are eating, she talks about it. When they are sleeping, she talks about it. And the man within one or two days will call the son and say, okay. And the man is not even wise. And he will say, it's my wife that saved you. You better go to her and go and thank her. Church. Church. They've destroyed everything. The discipline that we used to do in the spirit of God. The discipline that we used to be led from heaven. The discipline that we used to be led by the standard of the teaching of the word of God. Has become women's uh, rod to be using. And anybody, uh, if the wife of that leader is not happy with you, you are in trouble. We'll be pestering the husband. What do you think of uh, brother so and so? In this, our state capital, she is so rude, never knows how to say good morning to the pastor's wife. And this woman will pester her husband until the husband will find one flimsy excuse somewhere. You are late for coming to a workers' meeting, 10 minutes. It's not the lateness, it's the thing that the wife pumped inside. It's just looking for something to use. 
Uh, okay, because you are late, go. And then uh, she'll get back home and said, Darling, I got that man today. Uh, which man? The man you have been telling that I should kill now. That I should kill his spirit, kill his ministry, destroy his life. I've done it for you. I've killed Naboth for you. Uh, everything. Naboth is buried now. And then the woman will cook good food for her husband to thank her husband for killing a worker in the church. You women. Church. That's why the church has lost standard. But you pastor, when God chose you as a pastor, he called you like Abraham, he called you alone. And when your wife wants to intrude into the sacred ministry that is given to her by the Spirit of God, you tell her, woman, this is not family matter. This is a sacred office. And we are not sitting down together, ruling the church. I have been sent here from the headquarters. I am in charge. Shut up. You talk about cooking, we'll talk about that together. You talk about our own children, our little family, we'll talk about what, that one. About church, members in the church, you shut up. That will be a good church. But if, if we don't come back to the standard and it is your wife that is ruling the church telling you should not be preaching who should be preaching look, you give message to somebody if you give message to somebody didn't you pray before giving the message to him that brother so and so we're going to have a state retreat and you will preach and then you come back home and uh, your wife has no business no news to preach What's her business in that? And eventually the wife will come around and say, ah, uh, have you finished preparing the program? Starting. They want to start story. They want to start havoc. They're looking for Nabo to kill. Have you prepared the program? Yes, I've, I've just finished. Um, who are the people that are, that are speaking? Because this retreat, you know, I've been praying and, you know, we've won the power of God down. Don't mind her, it's a lie. It's looking for information. Well, brother so and so, who else? Brother so and so, who else? Sister so and so, who else? Brother so and so. Brother so and so, have you told him? I just told him yesterday so he can prepare in time. Ah, my spirit doesn't agree with that, brother. Your spirit? That's your business. If the Holy Ghost appear, uh, agrees with the brother, that's all. Your spirit, who cares for what your spirit agree, agrees with? My spirit doesn't agree with that brother. Eh, what, I don't know. Anytime I just see him, you know, the way he walks, the way he does his face, the way he sits down, the way he, he even looks at a person like this, no respect. The way I see him, my spirit does not agree. What am I going to do now? Uh -uh. Well, anyway, if you say I'm your wife and you love me, and we are doing this work together. We are suffering together. Okay, the man will say, I will see what to do. Then the man will call the fellow and say, uh, uh, Brother, have you started preparing that uh, message? I I've almost finished, sir. Something occurred to me. I'm thinking, um, all right. Uh, don't mind. Let me take that message from you. Uh, if there's any other thing I will give you when we get to the retreat, but uh, let me, don't worry. And whoever gives me, if I think I may even want to handle it myself, you understand? Uh, so, never mind, another time will do. Uh, and be praying for us, be praying for, we are all working together, whether we preach or not doesn't matter. I mean, everybody is working for God, they say, lie. And then we will go back home and say, my wife, you know, I found a method. How did you do it? Ah, you know me, you know me. Anybody I want. If you tell me to knock anybody, I know how to knock them. Church, the church is destroyed. We're not being led by the Spirit of God again. It's the wife that is pushing the man, pushing the man, pushing the man. And if you continue like that, well, by the grace of God, there are some of us who will rescue the church. But you, and your house will be destroyed. You are touching the church of God. God is raising up a brother. And is putting his spirit upon him. 
and you say your spirit does not agree with somebody God is raising up, this one is not politics. This one is church. Let your husband alone so he can give the message to whoever the spirit of God directs him. In the early years, this is how we did it. And this is how we did the work that, by the grace of God, things expanded. But now, as we have come to this stage, and there are Jezebel's wives that will not allow husbands to have a free hand in doing the work of God, please, we came to this Congress so as to brush off every corrupting thing in our lives and in the church. And I'm believing that this backsliding church is going to come back. And all the signs of backsliding that we're looking at, that I'm talking to you about, God is going to purge us in Jesus' name. Then there is congregational conspiracy against the truth. When the congregation frowns at the truth, when the congregation does not love, does not like the real pure teaching of the word of God, they will be backsliding. And when there is preference for compromising preachers, when there is desire for temporal blessing above spiritual blessing, or when there is unchecked sin in the congregation, no discipline again. Everybody is just doing whatever he likes. And we cannot talk straight to them and get things corrected. Or when prosperity and abundance without holiness and zeal is the other order of the day. Or when there is influence of strange preachers on us. You know, uh, in the early days of this uh, church, all the cassettes we listened to, they were uh, cassettes of deeper life. But we have children now, we have people who have raised up in this church. For a long time now, they have not listened to the cassette from the headquarters church here. They listen to the shouting, screaming American preachers. A lot of noise, but no revelation. A lot of, a long message, but no conviction. That's what a lot of our people are listening to now. And you are taking food that doesn't have spiritual nutrient. All those cases, they don't have spiritual nutrient. And sometimes when I see some of our preachers preach, I can tell they have outside influence, the way they preach. You can easily tell. The way they talk, the things they say, and even their interpretation that is not rich and deep enough to bring any conviction to anybody. You can see that they have been going along with this superficial kind of preaching that brings no conviction to anybody. Let's remove all those cases, all, those, all the literature, and all the things that are infiltrating into the church. And when there is partial obedience, unfaithfulness, and insincerity, that's the problem with Saul, that he went out to destroy the Amalekites. But instead of doing everything that he ought to do, he just did part of what he was supposed to do. If the church continues like that, and the church becomes backsliding, will God just uh, allow the church to go on like that? No, there will be wrath and judgment for backsliding churches, because God has no pleasure in a backsliding congregation. He always withdraws his presence from such congregation. The consequence of such withdrawal will be unanswered prayer. And when prayers are not answered, that in turn will lead to suffering under the power of darkness. It will cause sickness, mysterious death. In one deeper life church, that church, they were in the locality. They appeared to be moving on. And they were giving, you know, they were writing to me and giving me reports of, you know, expansion and this and that, vehicle, transportation, increase in number, this and that. But nobody knew what was happening under the, you know, under the carpet. 
But something started happening. People were dying in that church. I'm talking about deeper life. I'm not talking about any other church. Deeper life, local church, a branch. This and not not a not a church of thousands. You know, in a church of you know fifty thousand, uh, somebody will die once in a while as they get ho old, and you know, uh, you cannot uh, escape uh, because it's appointed unto man wants to die. After this, the judgment. But it's a small in a way we will i will call it a small church no thousands of people just moderate church and this fellow will just die this other fellow died again and i was you know receiving information mysterious death accidents a lot of things eventually the pastor there something struck him and for you know all of a sudden he couldn't walk. Couldn't move. And then the wife had been praying. But the wife did not know how to confront him because of what uh, she felt she knew. And said, ah, my husband, all that has been happening in this church, there must be a secret thing being covered somewhere. Eventually, the fellow opened up. He had been committing immorality. Not only that, he had been taking money from the family and giving to that other person regularly every month. And the family was, you know, just managing. And he will still take the money in the family and give to that other fellow. And the thing was on for some time. But now when the, when the wrath of God came and struck him, and the wife said, if the lion is running against this family, there's something behind the curtain. Tell me. And the thing came out. And the people over there to write to me to say, now we have discovered the reason for the mysterious deaths that has been taking place. And they try to cure the thing and, you know, they try to solve the problem. We don't know in your own church, your own local church, witches coming in, wizards coming in, familiar spirits, mysterious death, mysterious attack. Pastor's wife cannot sleep at night. What's happening? Pastor, you know the secret. Don't hide it. Expose the devil. Let's purge the church. And then once again, the light will shine. Before that time, your heart will be dark, will be gloomy. If you keep that secret, the mysterious death will continue. The wrath of God will continue. Why are you going to die in backsliding? You get restored as a pastor as a zonal leader, as a coordinator, as an area leader, as a woman rep, as a pastor's wife, as a worker in the church, you get restored and let's go back home and get the church restored. Let's rise up and pray. Is your local church backsliding? Pastor, what's your example? Pastor's wife, what's your example? Love of money will cause backsliding for the church. Immorality. Shameful relationship between men and women will corrupt the church and make the church to be backsliding. False prophecy. trying to manifest the gift of the Spirit without being baptized in the real sense of the Holy Ghost. Trying to manifest power without purity. Don't wait for the wrath of God to fall upon you and your family. Repent. Repent.